Hi, fourth graders. You guys ready for chapter 25? I tell you, I was so excited to get the feedback from many of you on chapter 24 that I couldn't wait to start reading again today. So 10 minutes, maybe more, maybe less. Let's see what happens. But Pablo and Bertie, chapter 25. On the television screen at Pierre's the next day, Darren Mandible was so excited at what he termed the high probability of the winds of change that he could not stop smiling. He was wearing what Lula referred to as his disco pants because they were white and stretchy. That was a good thing because when Darren was excited about the weather, he almost danced around the weather map. He, his pointer would sweep from side to side on the map and every sentence ended with an exclamation mark. Exciting new wind developments just offshore of the picturesque island town of Isla. Darren placed a wind magnet right over Isla on his weather map. Some map then turned back to the camera and did a little hop. For the first time since I can recall, weatherhounds, the Isla winds and are beginning to blow, not on shore, but away, away, which can pretend only one thing. Guess who else wants to listen to the story? Hi, Cooper. Mwah. Let's see if he behaves. He stabbed the pointer toward the camera and nodded furiously. His pony ponytail flapped back and forth. Winds of change, fortune lost, fortune gained. I have yet to see a fortune of any kind, said Lula, let alone lose one. And here is my colleague, Elmira Toledo, with the latest, Elmira. Elmira was dressed in a sky blue trench coat today, her purple glasses dangling from her non-microphone fingers. Darren, said Elmira, exciting developments to be sure. Who among us isn't interested in the existence of the seafarer? A few of us, said Lula. More than a few of us, said Pierre. The camera cut from Elmira to a white laboratory where a large cage was set up in the corner. Scientific looking people, and lots of them, stood there. Um, they were holding clipboards, and they were unsmiling. The camera cut back to Elmira, who was also unsmiling. Then again, Elmira was always unsmiling. I'm going to let you guys watch Cooper because that's what I'm kind of getting distracted by. Let's see if Cooper's going to be... Nope. Cooper, are you going to leave? All right. Back to reading the story. Cooper's going to go find something else to do for entertainment. Okay. So the unsmiling part. The camera cut back to Elmira. Then again, Elmira. Unsmiling. Proactive. Preparation on the part of our panel of experts from the avian scientific community. This has resulted in a new laboratory, she said, created with the express purpose of studying our seafaring parrot. Once a specimen is available for research, we must find it. The experts themselves interviewed in turn were divided on the existence of the seafaring parrot, given that the legend had held sway over the public mind for a very long time. That fact alone raised suspicions in the minds of some of the scientists. It really certainly sounds like it's going to last longer than we perceive it to, said one. But we humans hear it only as it happens, just like the rest of the animal world. Why would just one bird out of thousands of bird species in the world be able to hear all sounds at any time? It just doesn't make sense. Hmm. Others agreed. Science was about making sense. So why didn't this make sense? Hmm. The scientific principle held that m the most obvious explanation was usually the correct explanation. Which leads us to human nature, said one other reporter. Human beings are creatures of longing. They want to believe that the voices of their loved ones are still there, still available to them. Whether it's true or not, well, that's a different matter entirely. Most of the experts believed that the legend of the seafaring parrot was just that, legend. Remember what a legend is? Told from generation to generation over time. And remember, those can be exaggerated. There was simply no scientific basis to back up the legend. But Elmira Toledo's response was equally simple to all of this. That is only because none have been captured until we have the seafaring captivity and are able to study it. All of these questions will remain. 
That is why it is essential to find one and confine it in an enclosed space where we can study it. Kind of think to yourself, is that going to be fair to capture a bird just to study it? Hmm. The camera panned around the bright white laboratory. The cage was empty, save for a water bottle and a feeder attached to the side, a wooden perch, and what looked to be a bank of microphones arrayed along the top and sides. Electronic screens were wiggling, colored bars were arrayed on the other side of the lab. Pierre and Lula and Emmanuel and Pablo and Maria all frowned. Wouldn't life in a cage kill a seafaring parrot, said Pierre. Well, according to legend, yes, said Maria. Supposedly, they will die in captivity. Imagine if we had a seafarer in custody, Elmira said, as if she could hear them. Imagine if this mythical bird can, in fact, call forth the voices of the past. Imagine the questions of the past that could be laid to rest. Imagine the history that could be set straight. Sounds like they're leaning towards capturing it, doesn't it? Elmira tilted her head and leaned into the camera. What are the voices that you viewers would call forth if you could? She said, just think about it. Hollowed voices from the past brought to historical life again through the singular abilities of a seafaring parrot. She stole that question from my public art project, claimed Lula. Plagiarism, copyright, infringement, questioning thief. She's really putting her all into this one this year, Pierre said. Ratings must be down. Makes my blood boil, said Lula. But it's still a good question. Whose voice would you bring back if you could? Hmm. Well, someone important, of course, Pierre said. Someone essential to the course of human history. Someone, let's see, someone... Oh, just be honest, said Lula. Tell the truth. Don't be like all the tourists who just write down famous people. My grandfather then. Yes, I would give almost anything to hear my grandfather's voice just one more time. He used to sing happy birthday to me every single year. Pierre's looked very, eyes looked very bright. Good choice, said Lula. As for me, I think I would bring back the voice of my sister as a baby. I thought you and your sister weren't speaking anymore, said Pierre. Didn't you have like a big fight years ago? Yeah, we did. What was it about? She shook her head. Just something stupid. I don't even remember. Well, have you tried to call her? Yeah, once. She, she just hung up on me. But sometimes I think about her, the way we were when we were little, how she would laugh and laugh. Pablo looked over at Bertie again. She was standing on a chair, pecking at a plate of chopped mango. She didn't meet his eyes. She appeared to be completely focused on the mango. But Pablo was pretty sure she hadn't missed a single word in the entire conversation. How about you, Emmanuel? Lula said. Whose voice would you bring back? Emmanuel looked down at his hands, then over at Pablo. His eyes were very dark and sad. Come on, said Pierre, tell us. But Emmanuel just shook his head. And nobody asked Pablo. Now I can hear you thinking, no, don't stop reading. You guys always do that to me, right? Chapter 26. I'll read just a wee bit more. Down on the floor, Peaches and Sugar Baby were fighting over the same shred of coconut. Rody had lost interest and wandered back outside while Mr. Chuckles was laughing quietly to himself. Ha, 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 ha back in the corner. Maria had left to open the clinic. Two overheated tourists sat at a table in the back, fanning themselves with their plastic fold-up seafarer fans and bickering about how to spend the rest of the day. Just then, there came a commotion outside the bakery. The skittering of paws on the sidewalk, the flashing of a lopsided tail, and the... Dog. <laughs> the dog tore in, followed by Rody in hot pursuit. Oh, not again, shouted Pierre as the dog raced behind the counter, leapt up and snatched another elephant ear. <laughs> I forbid this. Drop that pastry. Ha, 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 ha. Holy crap, said Lula. That dog.
dog just never gives up. The dog had made it halfway back to the door. Crumbs spewing from his mouth, lopsided tail waving wildly when a voice, a man's voice began shouting. Do you feel like the author's doing a good time, a good job of showing how everybody feels? So the man shouting says, you despicable creature, you ugly, no good dog. Instantly, the dog skidded to a near halt and lowered himself onto his belly. He began to crawl toward the door. Fear rose from every trembling inch of the dog. And then the voice thundered down again. Worthless not. <gasps> the dog's eyes rolled with fear. Pablo's heart pounded in his chest. He looked around for the man, the awful man who must belong to the awful voice. Where's the voice coming from? There was no one in the bakery but Pablo and Lula and Pierre and Emmanuel. Oh, and the bickering tourists. And they all were staring at Birdie, who was standing on the chair with her wings raised. It's okay, Pablo said, it's okay. He knelt on the floor next to the dog who was still on his belly, still trembling. There was silence behind them. Pablo was afraid to turn his head. He put one hand on the dog's side to soothe him. Sharp ribs felt as if they were poking right through the dog's long matted fur. Poor guy, said Pablo. Pobrecito, said a woman's voice. Oh, and at that, I am going to stop. Look who came back to join us. Say hello, Cooper. <laughs> I think Cooper is enjoying the story, but I will check back with you guys in the middle of chapter 26 tomorrow. Have a good afternoon. Bye.